I'm Scott Owl Miller, and this is my daily life of living in Nicaragua as an expat. And today I'm going to get a little bit technical. For those who know me well, you know that I work in IT and have worked in IT for 35 years. And today I actually got a technical question, but one that specifically refers to things that you need when you're a full time traveler, digital nomad, or expat living abroad, and how you're going to store your data, protect that data. When you're doing that, it can be a little bit complicated because you have some challenges that you may not be used to uh, if you've always been living in a stable house house or whatever, and specifically storing your documents, your photos, your videos, that kind of stuff. How are you going to do that? How are you going to make it that you can use it really well? So we have a couple different aspects to look at. And while I don't normally do technical stuff on this channel, I think this is really good for people who are thinking about moving and, and being an expat or being a digital nomad because you can make your life a lot better by addressing some of these things well. So we're going to talk about that for Andrew O'Neill and all of you who have this interest. He's the one who asked the question, and we're going to get to that right after the bump. So Andrew O'Neill asked this question this morning about what, what do you do when you're looking at things like Google Drive? He has Google Drive currently, he's going over the limit, he's going to have to start paying for it. And so since it's going to start incurring a cost, what, what would you do as a traveler? What, what options exist? And this is a great question. Now for people who have not used Google Drive, you may be familiar with things like Dropbox or Box or uh, Amazon Drive used to be a thing, um, Microsoft OneDrive, Apple iCloud, like all of these different services exist and give you some number of options, and they vary a bit, to store some of your data online. Now, what data are you storing online? Now, this is gonna vary a lot for different people. Some of you are storing just a few simple things. Maybe you have a spreadsheet here and there, a few documents, a couple PDFs that you keep. Maybe you sold a home and you just wanna have a folder with some important financial information in it, whatever, it makes it be some really tiny amounts of stuff. Maybe you've got a bunch of big things like I do, loads of photographs and, and videos that you have to store uh, along with all those regular things, maybe some music you've downloaded, any number of things, project you're working on, video games, install files, you name it, you may have a lot of storage you have to deal with. So everybody has a little bit of a different scenario and to this recommendation needs to be kind of non-generic when it comes to what you're actually going to do. Everyone has different needs, both in scale and performance and accessibility and type of data, and whatever. But most all of us when we're traveling do have these needs and one of the mistakes that people often make is not addressing this before they start moving and then at in many cases, you have everything digitally that you need to have maybe on a laptop. And if that laptop was stolen or damaged or just wears out, what are you going to do? It can end up being quite a big problem. Even if you're not an expat or digital nomad, you're not living on the road, you have a very stable life and you just like watching this show uh, and, and you're never actually going to move anywhere, this can still apply to you. Having some protection and flexibility can be important in life. And of course, products like Google Drive and Dropbox and all those things can work really well and are generally very good companies and offer a good service. So they might be the right answers for you, but they're not free. And so that means that they are something that we should carefully consider because that becomes just another cost in your life and it adds up over time. Even if you're only spending five or 10 or $15 per month, that's not zero. And at the end of the year, that could be hundreds of dollars and over a decade or so, you could be looking at thousands of dollars that maybe could have been better spent somewhere else. And maybe it doesn't meet the best needs for you. It all depends. There's a lot of factors here. So let's talk a little bit about what these services do. So products like Google Drive give two really important aspects. One is storage. It's providing a place where you can put your digital products, whether it's videos or photos or documents, whatever. Being able to store those things somewhere is important because you're then able to know that, you know, if your house burns down or you're in the car and you're, you, you go to a hotel and you're like, oh no, I need that document. You know that it exists and you know you can access it. So that's the first aspect and probably the most important one. If you didn't have that, nothing else matters. The second is that Google Drive, along with some other products, provide a really beautiful interface to those files. It, that could be a number of different things. It could be that they function as a photo viewer. It could be that they function as a way to interact with your documents. Let's say you have a spreadsheet on Google Drive. You want to work with it with the Google Spreadsheet program sheets online. You're able to just connect and start using it, and you're able to edit and even do some really cool things like edit in real time with other people. So this interface to your data could be important, but for most of you, this is just a bonus. I'm not gonna say it's not valuable, it can be wonderful. It can be really, 
really nice in some cases, but it's generally not the thing that we're really worried about. As long as we have our data, we can find some other way to interface it, if you interface with it. If you do have a spreadsheet and you're storing it on Google Drive, but you don't want to use Google Sheets, well, you can just go get LibreOffice for free and that will work great. Yeah, you got to install it, whatever, but that's, it's free and it's easy. Like, okay, fine, no problem. If you're working with photos or videos, you're probably just using that storage as a means to, to keep them safe and anything you're gonna do with them is likely going to be done on your laptop or desktop anyway. So having an interface to them may not even be relevant or maybe it's just something to see some thumbnails so you can pick which one you're going to download or re-upload or make changes to uh, before you actually do so to speed your, yourself up, but you're, you're not really working with those files online in any way. So that's generally very secondary, but it is worth mentioning that a lot of the things we're talking about come with this functionality, especially Google Drive. And so some people may have that expectation when they're thinking about Google Drive that that it's an entire platform that they can interact with their data via. Uh, and that can be very nice for sure. So when you're looking to move abroad, how are you gonna deal with these things? Well, the first thing is you got to know if you can store your data somewhere, right? Now, can you take it with you? Just keep it on your laptop, keep it on a device you store with? Yes, you can do that. But what are you gonna do for accessibility? What are you gonna do for data protection? How are you gonna take backups and all that? You can do that, right? But it's gonna become much more cumbersome. So Andrew O'Neill asked the question, right? Have I ever looked at products like Cfile or Nextcloud? And would those potentially allow him to replace Google Drive? And so the quick answer is yes, absolutely. I've worked with them, of course. Uh, I actually worked with OwnCloud and was uh, very much involved with the split when they split into OwnCloud and NextCloud. I know the people who create NextCloud. I worked with their early community stuff and I've been an administrator on them for a very long time, since long before they were known as NextCloud. Uh, so I'm very familiar with these products and they can be absolutely fantastic. I'm a big NextCloud fan in case that wasn't apparent. So yeah, I think that they're a great option, and Nextcloud is designed for building essentially your own uh, Google Drive or your own Dropbox, and that may sound absolutely wonderful. Wow, I don't have to pay for those services anymore, but that's not actually true, so let's talk about this specifically. If you were going to go out and build your own replacement to Google Drive, the problem is, is that Google Drive is providing a data center service for storage of your products. If you go out and get Nextcloud or something like that, you still have to address the fact that it doesn't have storage. That's a physical thing. There's no way to get software to replace that. You have to have physical drives sitting in a data center that are holding your data. So if you get Nextcloud, where are you going to run it that has this storage that you're going to access? You're going to need to put it in a data center. Personally, I really like Vulture, but DigitalOcean, Linode, and some others are excellent. They will do that job for you perfectly. You can run Nextcloud there and then have them provide that storage to you. Fantastic. The problem here is that now you have to pay for that data center service. Now I do this. I use Vulture every day. They are amazing. I have literally hundreds of servers running on Vulture. So I definitely recommend them. I put my money where my mouth is in this case. But if I'm going to be using Nextcloud on Vulture, the chances that I'm going to spend less than I would just using Google Drive for that same storage is low. This is a high performance custom storage solution on Vulture and I have to deal with my own backups instead of Google's backups. Now the advantage is I have complete customizability. I can put as much performance behind it as I want. I can have as much storage or as little storage as I want. I can take any kind of backups that I want, anything I want. So if those things matter to you, then Nextcloud could give you the flexibility to do this in a really great way. But for most people, that's gonna be a lot of work and a lot of customization for something they probably don't need to customize. And it's probably going to incur quite a bit of cost above what you're expecting. And the reason for that is that you have to piece together all these things in a very custom way. And not only does that take a lot of your time, but you need a lot of resources from the data center. Uh, and those things are not carefully tuned and shared for doing just that task. Whereas Google Drive is on an unbelievably epic scale and they're carving out a tiny slice of a very uniform product that you're then using in that very minor way. And while companies like Vulture do their best to try to make that possible for you, there's no way to get that same scale and, and slicing nature when you're custom building in that way, you have to run an entire Nextcloud server just for you. So you have at minimum, you know, two gigs of RAM, two CPUs, whatever. That's absolute minimum to make it run and do what it needs to do. And even if you're only accessing it once every two months, that system has to sit there running just for you all the time. That's a lot of resources dedicated to you 
using something probably only once in a great while. Whereas with Google's product or Dropbox or anything like that, those systems are running uh, where they provide much larger systems, but you only get a tiny slice of it and only at the moment that you need to use it, millions, literally millions of other users are also using the system and they only have to provide enough capacity for however much anyone needs at any given time. And if they get overburdened, well, they just slow down a little bit and they, they manage to elasticize that workload a little bit and keep the cost way lower. So they're able to make profit while still providing a lower cost product. So while I love Nextcloud and I use it personally, and there's a lot of cases where I would say, yeah, for, especially for business where you have a lot of users, this can be a great way to uh, connect together. As an individual looking to do this, I don't think it makes very much sense because the the uh, scale of these of these products won't make any sense for you. It'll end up costing you a lot of money because you got to pay for the storage, you got to pay for the dedicated server, you got to pay for the overhead of doing the whole thing, and you have to put in a bunch of work yourself. Yeah, is it easy to do? Yeah, relatively easy to build your own Nextcloud server. That is not particularly a major problem. It really comes down to uh, what are you going to pay for, right? If you go with uh, a completely dedicated host like Vulture, easily you're going to run $20, $30 a month as a starter package, and you're only going to get 20, 30 gigs of storage. That is tiny. Um, that's not going to make any sense. If you're dealing with uh, a regular web host, which is very rarely a good idea, uh, they tend to charge more uh, or almost as much as someone like Vulture, but you get a tiny fraction and none of the flexibility. But if you were to do that, in theory, you may be able to spend just a tiny bit less money, but you'd be lucky to get a couple gigs of storage and the performance may be so low that the product may not even run or be very painful to use. None of these things generally make sense. And if you are going to have a ton of storage, then you are have to find some way to get that. And the data centers tend to be very expensive for that. So even scaling up may not save you money. Even if you had to save uh, store 10 terabytes, it's probably cheaper to do so on Dropbox or on Google Drive than it is to go to a, a data center like, like Vulture and do it that way. You can, in theory, do a bunch of work and connect things like uh, Backblaze B2 or Wasabi uh, to something like uh, Nextcloud and get the cost down if you're doing it on really big scale. And maybe at really massive scale, you could make that make sense. But you're talking really, really large systems, not uh, people who are looking at an alternative to Google Drive. You're getting into systems that are so custom that you probably were looking at custom solutions already. So custom solutions like this, while they're particularly powerful and flexible, generally aren't going to make sense for normal people. If you if you are looking at just being a digital nomad, you're just looking at being an expat and you just want some way to store your data, I love these solutions, but they're not for you. They're really designed around business and very specific business cases. The average business may make sense to have them, uh, especially if you're already going to have a Vulture account. You're already putting other workloads there. You're able to combine things like we do. We have hundreds of servers on Vulture, putting one more with Nextcloud. It's just part of the things we're already doing. It's very efficient. But if you're doing it, and then, of course, if you're doing it as a hobby, and yeah, maybe it's a few extra dollars, but you really enjoy it, and you like the flexibility, and it's fun to have your own thing, and yeah, you're going to share it with some family and friends then maybe it makes sense for you. I'm not saying it doesn't. Just be aware that generally you're doing it because it's fun and accessible, but not because it absolutely makes the most business sense for you. It is true that if you have a large family and you're traveling a lot and you're doing it for the entire family, for example, maybe uh, like us, it's, you know, me and my wife and my kids and, you know, my business partner and I have some friends here and I could I could make it available to my dad and I can make it available to my extended family and, and family all over the world and run a single system. So it's kind of like having our own Google Drive and, and treating our family or friend group as a business um, and creating a big resource where we can all use it and we all maybe are chipping in on the money or we're just giving it away because you don't care about the money and everyone's getting benefit out of it. And you're able, and one of the things would be then you could share data between people. That's really where those things are meant to be used. They're not meant for a single user to store their own data and retrieve it. Of course you can, but they're designed for a number of users to be within a tight security group and you can easily share the data between each other. So for example, if I was to upload a video that I'm working on, I could share the link to it to my father who's in the United States and he could grab that file and he could work on it and put it back. Or if we had a document like a spreadsheet, you know, we could both work on it at the same time because uh, Nextcloud and some of those products allow you to do those same kind of things in the same kind of way as a Google Drive or whatever. That stuff's great. But if you're not doing those features, it's a, it's a lot of overhead for something that probably doesn't make sense. If you were to use this for yourself and it's purely file storage, 
you would much more likely want to use something much simpler um, and just it, still you could go to a vulture you could still get the same type of storage uh, that you have do whatever you're going to do but just use a really basic Linux server connect to it with a uh, SCP client or an SFTP client like uh, FileZilla or something like that some uh, computers have built in products that do this you don't even need to add anything and just attach to that remotely and upload and download files as you need them that's the simplest thing, right? Just super easy, very secure, no extra products. You could have it done in minutes um, and, and it would in theory be a little bit cheaper because you don't have as much overhead. You don't need as big of a server to do it. You can also get products like that, like CyberDuck, that'll connect directly to something like Backblaze or Wasabi, and you don't have to have uh, your own server at all. You're purely just taking your desktop and connecting to a remote uh, storage device, and that would be the most logical way to do that you could get very, very, very cheap storage without that extra interface. So you have options for those things, uh, depending on how you want to work, how you want to share, what you want to do, and very likely that's all you want to do is just something as simple as possible. Now, one of the things that I do want to mention, though, is some people do want to be able to share uh, around their house or have a lot of data inside their house. And this is where I use a Synology NAS device. That's network attached storage. Uh, it's a small box. I don't have a big one. It costs about $300. Uh, it has a CPU it's got RAM in it like it's a it's a server but it's just a small little box it sits in my office I have currently a single 14 terabyte drive in it about to add a second one tons of storage because I do a lot of I just do a lot of media storage right so I need to do something really big um, and with the Synology I basically get a Google Drive or a Nextcloud experience from just the Synology. It's not quite as robust as Nextcloud, but it gives me uh, the majority of that functionality uh, without me having to do anything. And it gives me a device inside my house that I'm able to put that on so I don't have to go out and, and assemble something myself. Of course I can. I wrote the book on this. Literally, I there are devices like this named after me because I have put a lot of my career into building these devices. So this is something that I know I could easily go do myself. But even for me, getting the hardware dedicated in very specific ways from Synology where they handle all the updates, they handle all the features, they handle all the like dealing with getting the right kind of hardware for it, just makes it so easy. There's no way for me to do it cheaper than $300. Uh, and so I have this really nice device that can hold a ton of stuff. And when I run it in the house, I can have this insane amount of storage I don't have to pay monthly. I just pay for it one time for the $300 and now it's in the house. Now I do need to back it up. If I'm gonna protect that data, I gotta deal with backups and that is always where part of the challenge is. But it's really easy if you wanna have something like that and back it up to say a Backblaze or a Wasabi, the Synology will attach and do that backup itself. So you, you still have to pay for it, but it will handle all that for you. And so you can kind of get a hybrid where you have a big storage device that's very fast and it's inside your house, this doesn't work for digital nomads who are traveling around a lot, but if you're an expat and you're living down here and like we want a ton of data inside the house, so we share it and I do a lot of my media stuff, right? It gives me a place to put that online and I can work from it from any computer. It allows me to share things between computers that are really big. It, it's important for me. It's not normal. I'm not saying this is right for you, but for, for some people it makes sense. Um, getting a device for like 300 and then just adding whatever hard drives to it makes sense for you. So those for, are about $300 per drive for me as well. Um, can be really good. You can, if you want, put NextCloud on that instead of paying for it monthly in a data center. You could have NextCloud on there. You move the storage inside your house. You can get that NextCloud-like experience. It's the actual NextCloud experience simply by running it on top of the Synology. And then as long as you're taking a backup of that data, that could work. Just be aware that if you're doing this inside your house with a device like this, how are you going to access it if you're somewhere else? And maybe that's something you don't care about. Maybe if you go somewhere else, you're like, I don't want my data. I know it's safe. That's all I care about. Okay, great. Then you're in great shape. But if you want to have access to it somewhere else, then having a device inside your house that holds your data probably isn't the smart way to go. It just isn't practical. Could you find ways to expose that data online? Normally, yes. It can be very difficult, especially like here in Nicaragua. They do not make the networks uh, that they provide to you uh, designed in such a way for you to host services from home. You're uh, what's called double natted that basically blocks being able to provide those services in any easy way to the outside world. There are always ways, right? I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm saying that you're moving from, hey, this is an easy thing that people do to, no, this really requires an IT professional. It really requires someone who really is willing to put in the time and research, try a bunch of things, and it's always going to be a bit more effort, like installing a WireGuard VPN system or uh, zero tier, something like that to work around some of the limitations. Totally doable. 
and if it's your hobby or you just think it's gonna be a lot of fun, absolutely feel free to go do it. I'm not saying it's, it's a bad idea. I'm saying that for normal people, it could be insurmountable or just really annoying uh, from the amount of work that would go into that. But if that's something that matters to you, you can make it happen um, with good security and, and you can keep that cost pretty low. And for some people, especially expats who are retirees, if it's something you find entertaining, then it could be a very good value. And this is where I do find that if you were to have something like this analogy, probably not as big as mine, right, and, and have put in some data protection, what most people want to do is put two drives in there, put them in what's called a RAID array, uh, where you have RAID 1, they're mirrored between them, so you have a lot of protection. If one of the hard drives dies, the other one still has your data, just replace the other one and it, and it mirrors it again. Protects against a lot of problems. Um, do that, run it inside your house, uh, have, you know, if you want Nextcloud as a front end to it, that's fine. If not, Synology provides its own front ends that work really well. Um, they've got tools for accessing it remotely. You can add things like WireGuard or Zero Tier to access it from absolutely anywhere if that's what you want to do with a lot of security. Um, and then just do a backup of that to Backblazer Wasabi, someone like that, even Amazon S3, but they're super expensive. You can do that. You can have a really powerful, robust system for not too much money inside your house. You don't have to pay monthly, and the only thing you're going to pay monthly for is the backups. And you can price that out with, say, Backblaze B2 and see what the pricing would be like for the amount of backups you would take. That could be something that gives you a very nice blend of performance and functionality and ease of use and uh, flexibility, but also keeping your data safe someplace. So if anything was to happen to that device, to your house, to you, you suddenly had to leave, you know, you had to travel and you left it behind by accident or were forced to, you wouldn't have to worry about your data. That could be an answer. So overall, I think for most people, right, very importantly, paying a little bit for a Google Drive or a similar service, Dropbox or whatever, is probably worth it. You have a certain amount of data that you really want to protect. And having multiple services is absolutely fine. I protect all of my photographs using Flickr. I pay uh, something like $100 per year, which is super expensive until you understand that I have about 50,000 images and they've been viewed over 100 million times. That's a major social media platform for me and it gets a lot of word out about this show and other things. Um, it's an important part of my creative ecosystem. It probably doesn't make sense for you, but it might. You could also build your own system like that. You can always build your own systems like any of these things, but generally you're going to pay more and probably get less or at least pay a lot more and have to put in a lot of effort for about equal services, even though maybe it's a little bit more flexible, you're probably not gonna save money. Could be a cool hobby, absolutely fine to do, just probably not a good business decision. From a business perspective, from a what actually makes financial sense for me standpoint, almost certainly using the major existing services that are already out there that you're already probably using to some degree, they're gonna be all but unbeatable once you're having to put any amount of data online and protect it. And it's going to allow you to focus on other things, right? You don't generally, unless it's your hobby, you don't want to be forced to spend a whole bunch of effort making sure that your data is working, keeping the systems updated, uh, taking backups, making sure that all those things are done. That said, just be aware, a lot of those things like Google Drive don't necessarily provide backups. They may expect you to do backups on some of them. So make sure that you're paying attention to what service you're using and how much backup you need. You don't always need backups with things like that because they often have 11 nines durability, which means you don't need backups. Um, basically, that means they will out survive humanity by massive amounts. Um, so it, backups to protect against that failing is probably silly because once that fails, probably your backup's going to fail too. It doesn't matter. Um, or, or you may be in a scenario where you just don't care about the backups at that point because the world has ended or whatever. Uh, but it is something worth considering um, that, that it, they don't have backups. So you need to make sure you're having some amount of protection against accidental deletions and that most of those things have version control that does that. I'm going into a lot of details so you probably don't need. But basically those services, the big ones like Google and Dropbox are going to provide you with so much robustness and reliability at such a low price under normal circumstances that you're going to really struggle to come up with any way to work around them. If you want to be even cheaper, look at things like CyberDuck or free open source tools, whatever, that's one I just happened to know off the top of my head, that allow you to connect to an account at Backblaze B2, where you can get something like a terabyte for, I don't know, $5 a month. Uh, that's a lot of storage, and you're just moving it up and down using a client on your desktop. That may be, if you if you have a, a larger amount of stuff and, and you don't care about having that robust interface to it, that may be the best option for just saving your money. If you're looking at pure backups, then you want to look at something else like just Backblaze backups um, or, or other tools like that probably that go that just back up online. You just want your stuff to be protected. You want to keep it as simple as possible. You don't want to make 
extra work for yourself under normal circumstances. And in that one niche where you want bigger storage, lower overall cost, but you're willing to invest up front, uh, and, and you really want to focus with stuff inside your house, and you're not so worried about mobility, then a Synology NAS device, just generally a small one, about two bays. Um, I really like the model, and I can't remember the number like a 214 or something. It's about $300 currently on Amazon in the US uh, without any drives. I really like that model. It works great. Having that inside your house can make a lot of sense for a lot of people, um, especially if you're you know, downloading a bunch of stuff and you don't want to keep it all the time. You don't need backups of that, but you have big files to work with. Uh, like I do, sometimes I'm moving 30, 40 gigs around at any given moment. It allows me to do that in a really simple way that I couldn't do if I was doing stuff online. That can make a lot of sense if you're in that unique position, um, so don't rule it out. But pretty much, those are the, your options and the ways that I would think about it. Keep it simple. I love those solutions, but they probably aren't going to apply to expats and digital nomads under, under normal circumstances. But certainly, if you have a special case, get down in those comments and ask me. I'd be happy to answer that. And as always, if you would like and subscribe, I'd appreciate it. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Miller. That comes directly to me, helps make this all possible. I do have another channel where I do just tech uh, and not this stuff. It's a much older channel. This is my career, uh, is working in this space. So this is this is a lot of what I do. As always, tell a friend about the show, and uh, if you'd post on social media, that would be uh, super handy. This kind of stuff is great in an expat forum somewhere to help people understand what their options are and know where they can ask questions. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And hopefully I get four episodes up on the screen. If you could click on one, I'd really appreciate it.